Right, it's Wednesday, time for this week's Morse Code of Weather. Jacob is here. And a brand new series starts right now. It's going to be a fun one. It's going to be about weather radars. So we talked about weather balloons a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Now also at the National Weather Service, you have those radar sites, the big soccer ball you see next to the office. <laughs> right. Those are what we use to see precipitation all across the country. So we'll be taking a first preview of it is the basics about what radar is. It is an acronym actually that stands for radio detection and ranging. And there's many radar sites across the country. Again, they're located at each National Weather Service office. In North Dakota, we have one in Bismarck. There's also one in Minot. Then there's the one just to the west of Grand Forks and also the one at the Glasgow uh, National Weather Service office. Here's what we can view with our weather radars. This is the coverage that we have across the country. There are some gaps in the coverage, but for the most part, we can see radar. We can see where precipitation is all across the uh, United States. So the way that radar works and because of the acronym, the radio, it sends out radio waves. And as those radio waves propagate into the atmosphere and interact with particles, those could be hydrometeorites meteors like rain, snow, hail, the uh, radio waves bounce back to the radar and the radar listens for those radio waves to be bounced back from particles and precipitation in the atmosphere and that's how the radar picks up precipitation, determines how far away it is based on how long it takes for that radio signal to be uh, transmitted out and then received back as well as the intensity of the precipitation. So the radar itself in Bismarck is 65 feet above the ground and the big white ball at the top is called a rad uh, radome. The radar dome for short is called the radome. We'll take the journey of how this uh, radio wave gets up to there. So it all starts in this transmitter, which is known as a klystron, which has an oscillator in it that produces the radio frequency energy that's sent up to the radar to then be sent out into the atmosphere. The radio waves look like sine waves, and the size of these waves is based on the frequency that the radar is outputting. So that is the waveguide, which is the rectangular tube that the radio frequency is sent out on. And that goes all the way up to the radar. Those red arrows denote where that uh, frequency tube goes all the way up to the radar site. So as we walked up our five flights of stairs to the radome, we could see the waveguide, that rectangular tube, carrying the radio frequency energy all the way up 65 feet to the radar. Once we climbed inside the bottom door of the radar, it's pretty incredible to see how expansive the radar our dome actually was. It's made of fiberglass, which allows the radio frequency to pass through it. The metal dish, which is what the radar is actually sent out on, is 28 feet wide. And we're still following that rectangular waveguide tube that brings the radio waves to the front of the dish. In front of the dish is a feed horn where the waveguide ends. This shoots the radio waves against the dish. The dish focuses the energy and sends it out into the atmosphere. When the signal bounces off precipitation and is returned to the radar, the dish focuses this energy, goes back to the feed horn where it is sent to the transmitter to be interpreted. Keep in mind when the radar is in use, this dish is spinning to get a 360 degree picture of the atmosphere. And despite its size, the dish itself can actually be pushed when it's not in operation, which you can see me doing here. We'll talk more about exactly how that radar dish can be moved a little bit uh, later on next week. But we want to go over to Chauncey Schultz now, a meteorologist at the National Weather Service, and he'll explain more in detail exactly how those radars work. So the radar sends out energy for about seven seconds out of any minute. And the rest of the time, it is really listening. It's waiting to hear back where it's sensing precipitation, where those radio waves are bouncing off essentially clouds and precipitation. It spends a lot of time listening to give us the best information that we can back. The more intense the rain is, the more that energy is sort of attenuated as it comes back. And so we know from that how much energy comes back to the radar, how intense the rainfall is, how big the hail is. That's all determined based on how much energy in that wave-like frequency, the radio frequencies essentially, that come back to the radar. So the radar data that comes back, of course, is in sort of a raw format. We have what we call the radar product generator. It's a processor, an algorithm, just like you might have a fiber optic cable, for example, that's feeding internet to your home. It's all different kinds of electric signals that have to get converted into usable data by a processor, by a computer. Same thing with the radar. We take all of that ra raw data and convert it into things that we know and can interpret as meteorologists. It happens at the radar product generator, which is located in our office in the Weather Service, that turns the data into imagery that we're used to accustomed to seeing on our weather apps, seeing 
on the TV and that we watch uh, in our, as meteorologists in our office. That data is simultaneously fed to our what we call advanced warning information processing system in the weather service. And it's also simultaneously distributed everywhere. So it's an immediacy. Once the radar data is collected after that couple of minutes, that radar data goes out to the world immediately. And radars are so important. We use it every day to see where precipitation is tracking and to give everyone an early warning of where the thunderstorms are tracking, where the heaviest snow is, etc. And so even true. someone like me who doesn't really understand the weather, I rely on the radar a lot too. On I'm constantly app, right? looking at yeah. it on their app because is it raining at the farm? Is it right. going to rain here? It's so yeah. important to have radar and, and as far as the tools that meteorologists use, radar and satellite data, a lot of that goes into computer modeling, most of it does, mm -hmm. and that helps gives us the forecast data for, for the future events. So mm -hmm. it's amazing. Good and stuff. And now you know exactly what's mm -hmm. inside the radar. We're yes. going to go a lot more in depth as to how all, how all that equipment works together and all the different products that we use with radar. It's not just that reflectivity, what the precipitation looks like. There's so many different products that we use. We'll go uh, more into that in the coming weeks. I always we? wondered what was inside that big soccer <laughs> ball. Now I know. Thanks, yeah. Jacob. Well, Getting I learned a here. lot last week, so see if you can top it. Yeah. Yeah, we went inside the radar last week. This week, we're going to be talking about how the radar takes a three-dimensional slice of the atmosphere uh, a couple hundred miles out from the radar site. So if you remember from last week, the radar sends out radio waves and as they propagate through the atmosphere, they interact with precipitation. The precipitation uh, scatters those radio waves back to the radar. All this happens in less than a second from when the radar disseminates those radio waves and then it receives it back and turns that into those radar images that we see. The problem is, is that the radar has its beam go up at a little bit of an angle. And with the curvature of the Earth, the farther of the way that you are from the, way, the, from, from the radar, the higher up in the, in the atmosphere that you're sampling. So if we look at the radar site over here, our radar beam going up, and it can miss sometimes low-level clouds. That's usually uh, a common theme in the wintertime where you have clouds that are a lot lower to the ground producing snow versus thunderstorms in the summer that are a lot taller. So the way that we uh, assess how high the radar is scanning the atmosphere, we look at the elevation angle. We start at 0.5 degrees and we go all the way up to 19 degrees in the atmosphere and that samples the atmosphere three-dimensionally. So we can determine how far away the radar beam is scanning and how high up it is. So this is the area that we have the best coverage from the Bismarck radar but we can get a little bit of more data elsewhere about 150 miles out from the radar but again it's sampling the atmosphere a lot higher up in those locations so with the Bismarck radar you can see westward we have less radar coverage just based on how high up the radar beam is going as it goes away from the radar site and the height of the Bismarck radar also plays a role because the height determines where that 0.5 degree elevation angle starts. The reason the Bismarck radar has to be 65 feet tall is because of the surrounding topography. It's a little, uh, the National Weather Service radar is in a little bit of a valley down by the airport. For more on why the radar needs to be at a certain height and all the different elevation angles, here's Chauncey Schultz with the Weather Service. So when we're dealing with finer precipitation, lighter precipitation, say snowflakes for example, they're pretty small. So it's harder to detect that if the radar is spinning too fast. So the way we handle this is through what we call volume coverage patterns. So snowfall, for example, forms a lot closer to the ground than say thunderstorm clouds do, but we also know it's more sensitive. It's harder to detect. So we operate the radar in a little slower fashion and it spins around more slowly, gives it more time to pick up on the small snowflakes, small rain drops when we're dealing with lighter precipitation. And then it might go up to 1.5 and three degrees slice above the elevation. There's no need to go really high in the sky when we're dealing with rain and snow because all of that precipitation forms relatively near the ground. When we're dealing with thunderstorms, on the other hand, we know that the updrafts and thunderstorms are rising really to 50,000 feet in the worst case scenarios. And we know that the thunderstorms are developing, evolving very quickly. So in that case, it's more important for us to get a fast, full volume scan is what we would call it in the radar when it makes all of its revolutions and goes up in elevation scans. So during thunderstorms, we're going to employ what we call a volume coverage pattern that is faster and it goes up from 0.5 and it adds more elevation slices too. So we're actually building a bigger 3D picture of the radar during thunderstorms. And again, we can control that as meteorologists from the weather service, what volume coverage pattern that the radar is actually operating in. And we do that based on the type of weather phenomena that we're expecting and that we're observing. For operating in that mode that 
is for snowfall or light rain, that takes about six minutes for a complete radar picture to be determined. If we're operating in thunderstorm mode, so we're spinning the radar a lot faster, maybe getting a little less fine details higher up in the sky, but we're going all the way high up in the sky and really getting those fine details of thunderstorms, it can be completed in about four minutes. And we actually have new technology with the radar where we can actually, halfway through its elevation slices when it's going up and around, drop the radar back down and scan that lowest elevation slice that's right near the Earth to get a sense of what might be going on with rotation in the clouds, potential tornadic activity right near the ground. Thanks a lot, Jacob. Part three in your series coming up next week. And of course, the radar series continues. Always a good topic. I keep thinking I know everything about a weather radar, and then Till you now, tell right? me something new. Right. There's so much more to go into. This is part three, and there's so many complicated parts that go into the inside of the radar. So we're going to go back inside the radar and take a closer look at some of those mechanical parts that make the whole thing work, that make our radar successful. So we first week, we talked about how the radar rotates around 360 degrees. Last week, we talked about the tilt, how it goes up in elevation angles. But there's a special housing in the center of the radar that controls that rotation. And when you think about it, you have to get information and signals up to the rotating part of the radar without twisting any wires. So we'll take a closer look at that. And what happens is in this housing is a slip ring assembly. That's where the motor is that rotates the radar, as well as a box where the signals are transferred up to the spinning part of the radar through metal contact. Metallic layers are stacked up on top of each other with each tidbit of information that needs needs to go up to that spinning part of the radar transferred through those uh, metallic disks. So now, up farther up on the radar, you have those motors that move the radar up and down, what we call the elevation motors. And those are controlled and get to all of our different elevation angles. Back down at the ground, we have our backup generator that allows for the radar to operate just in case there's any power outages, and that's powered by diesel. Fortunately, that has not had to be had to been used within the past year or so. Now also, there's technicians that the National Weather Service employs, and those technicians service the weather radar in case anything goes wrong, and they're on call 24-7. Chauncey Schultz talks more about the National Weather Service technicians. At least once a month, they go out and do maintenance checks, things like changing the oil and things like this. This is a piece of machinery, just like your car. So we have highly trained technicians, skilled technicians, that prov provide at least monthly maintenance to the radar, more often as needed. If something happens to break, they make an immediate fix to it. Since the radar was originally installed in 1994, we've only taken the golf ball or the soc soccer ball off one time. That was actually about a year and a half ago. And the reason that we did that is part of what we call the Service Life Extension Program. So the radar itself has been installed for going on 30 years now, but we've improved the parts in it. We continue to improve and extend the life cycle of the radar to provide life-saving information. Thankfully, our radar has never been damaged, but other radar sites certainly have been. Most recently, the Rapid City, South Dakota radar last summer was pummeled with really large hail and strong winds. And just like anything on your house that might be made out of fiberglass, it was damaged. And so the repair process for that takes time. In extreme cases, with hurricanes, for example, there have been some instances when the radars have been totally destroyed. In that case, to completely rebuild a radar, it takes a long time, many, many months to rebuild a radar. Thankfully, that's only happened a very small number of times in history. There is actually a repository of spare parts, if you will, that to help rebuild radars if necessary, but it takes time and process to completely rebuild one from scratch. So fortunately, our weather radars in North Dakota haven't been damaged like those near the Gulf Coast or even down mm -hmm. south in South Dakota with hail. But you need those technicians, just like with the television mm -hmm. operation, we rely on technicians to uh, help us out in case anything goes wrong. With weather service radars, because it's a complicated machine, you need people to service it. Yeah, it looks complicated. It is complicated, but there's so much that goes into it that we don't even know, right? We just want to get the radar on television and as an end user, but all of the hardware that goes mm -hmm. into the software mm -hmm. that gives us all these products, Doppler radar and things like that's fascinating. And the two most important things that the radar does is obviously spin around 360 degrees, but we also need it to go up to all those different elevation angles yeah. like we talked about last week. We might be doing a volume scan on thunderstorms here in the next few hours. Oh, okay. Keep you up to date on that. Okay. So thanks a lot, Jacob. Sounds good. You're thanks, Jacob. Yeah. But a lot of times when we're looking at radar on our apps, it's just looking at reflectivity mode, which is just what we could see with precipitation. But we can look at radar behind the scenes too to see inside thunderstorms as to how they're rotating and the speed that they're moving at to detect 
detect where tornadoes are, where damaging winds are within thunderstorms. So we've gone over the basic aspects of radar, how they send out uh, radio frequency energy, and that's uh, received back by the radar once it bounces off of precipitation. You might have heard of the Doppler effect. That's going to be one of the kind of core concepts for how the radar detects the speed and direction of precipitation. Now, the Doppler effect works when you have some kind of moving object coming towards an observer. When it's coming towards you, you have a higher frequency. When it's going away from you, you have a lower frequency. And the person that discovered this was Christian Doppler. That's why, who it's named after back in 1842, an Austrian physicist. And here's an example. You might have uh, most commonly heard this related to a car horn or just a loud engine moving past you. Here's an example of how the Doppler effect works in the real world. So similar to how the car is moving away from you and having that lower pitch, we can change the frequencies or the wavelengths of the energy that is being emitted by, from radar. Remember, the radar is emitting that radio frequency energy. So these wavelengths can be compressed when the rain or the objects are moving away from the radar. And when they're moving towards the radar, they're more compressed. Excuse me. When they're moving away from the radar, the frequencies are a lot longer. So similar to that Doppler effect, you have the radio frequency energy going out to thunderstorms. It's being bounced off of that. When the storm is moving towards the radar, that energy gets more compressed. The wavelengths get pushed together more. You have a higher frequency. And the radar can detect that. When the storm is moving away from the radar, those frequencies are farther apart from each other. So here's another kind of schematic of that. It's precipitation moving away from the radar site. Your frequencies that are coming back, those red lines, are farther apart from each other versus when the precipitation is coming towards the radar site. The frequencies, the green lines in this example, are a lot closer to each other. And that's very important and powerful information when we're looking inside of thunderstorms. So this is that basic reflectivity mode that's telling us how heavy it's raining out. But with this kind of hook echo shape, we can usually tell that that's a tornado. But looking inside the storm with that velocity data, we can see the greens indicating the precipitation going towards the radar, the reds moving away from the radar. So you can see that rotation within the storm. A little bit of a more subtle example, when you don't have that kind of hook echo on your reflectivity mode, we could also see the winds moving towards and away from the radar site. And that can detect where rotation is. And we can call that a velocity couplet. Velocity couplets are what meteorologists use to issue tornado warnings by just looking at this velocity data and other products. But this velocity data is really one of the most important things to see inside the storm, see that there's really tight rotation and strong rotation, because we can tell how fast those particles are moving right next to one another, and then issue a tornado warning. Here's one example from North Dakota back in 2010 in Burke County with this tornado, a real life image of it. But on radar, we could see that rotation with the bright greens and the bright reds right next to one another, indicating that rotation within a storm. So how does this uh, information get utilized for meteorologists to issue tornado warnings. Here, Chaun here is Chauncey Schultz explaining more about that. So when we say that there is a radar indicated tornado, what we're really sensing is that there's strong rotation in the clouds right near the ground. We can't most of the time positively say that there is for sure a tornado. But what we can sense is that there is really strong rotation a few thousand feet above the ground or as close to the ground as we can get with the radar. And that very often is a tell that a tornado is going to form soon. So we're trying to gain lead time, advanced warning on the tornado genesis is what we would call it. And we can do that by sensing inside the clouds, seeing which direction those motions are within the clouds. If they're rotating very quickly, then we can issue a tornado warning that is radar indicated that a tornado could form at any time. And it's not just with tornadoes, with how fast the winds are moving within a storm, we could see that there's a very strong uh, downdraft or something that's going to produce damaging winds when we look at that velocity data. Hmm. It's kind of like a detective work you're doing there. Yeah, basically, we could see kind of a scope inside the storm where you can't really see that from just outside. Yeah. <laughs> These radio frequencies are amazing, and it's helped us as meteorologists along over the decades really pinpointing the severity of storms and tornado detection. So it's just fascinating. Before you had radar, um, what did what did you do to? Well, you don't remember that, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> what what did what did uh, weather uh, meteorologists do? The tornado detection has improved greatly since mm -hmm. we've 
gotten this Doppler technology within the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. And with that Doppler technology, our tornado lead times have improved. So before that, we couldn't really assess where exactly tornadoes were before. It was a lot more challenging. Yeah, yeah you guys do true. a good job of warning us. It's Wednesday, so that means meteorologist Jacob Morse is here with today's Morse Code of Weather. Of course, talking more about your radar series, which is fascinating, mm -hmm. no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's so many things that we could do with weather radar. There's so many capabilities that it has, and we've been upgrading it over the years to give it more capabilities to help us warn for severe weather specifically. So last week, we talked about velocity mode on radar and how that can allow us to see inside of storms to see the uh, speed and direction that precipitation is moving in. So for example, with severe weather, we could see that there's rotation within storms to detect tornadoes as well as damaging straight line winds. Usually when you load up your radar app, you could see the reflectivity mode, which just gives us the information about how heavy the precipitation is in a certain area. But there's also other types of products. We'll follow that waveguide back inside the radar. And inside the radar, that waveguide that brings up the radio frequency energy actually splits into two at the radar dish. So inside the radar, the waveguide is in two separate parts. And as the signal is being transmitted out from the radar, it goes in both the horizontal and the vertical directions. And that's what's called dual polarization radar technology. So the radar sends out horizontal pul pulses and vertical pulses. And what that allows is us to see the size, the shape, and the variety of different uh, particles in the atmosphere. So you have your radio frequency energy that looks like sine waves in the horizontal direction and with our dual polarization radar technology, we can send it out not only in the horizontal direction, but also in the vertical direction. That allows us to see the size and shapes of, for example, raindrops and hailstones. And the reason why that is important is because we can detect all the different types of precipitation that is falling, as well as seeing where there could be further intensification within supercell thunderstorms. So the reason why this is important is because you have different shapes of, and sizes of raindrops, hailstones are different sizes, snowflakes are different sizes, and we could also tell if there's non-hydrometeors, uh, non-precipitation types in the atmosphere as well. So raindrops can be a bunch of different sizes. Once you get into the really big rain drops that's where it looks like hamburgers because of the uh, the wind speeds as the raindrops are falling down to the ground and obviously hail can be in different sizes with spikes or smooth hail round hail st uh, stones as well so one of the dual polarization products is called differential reflectivity what this allows us to do is compare the vertical scale and the horizontal scale of the particles. So this is an example from 2021 in Morton County. You can see that on this section of the radar, we are detecting large hail because of the very low differential refractivity values. We were able to see that behind the scenes and then warn that supercell for baseball sized hail. On our normal reflectivity mode, there was also a hail spike. What that means is that we can see the hail uh, attenuating the radar in a way that, that gives us another indication there's very large hail within that strong thunderstorm. The second dual polarization product I want to mention was correlation coefficient. That allows us to see inside the storm uh, detecting how similar or dissimilar particles are. In this case, this was in Rolla and Towner County in 2016 when there was an EF2 tornado and this was seeing where we were lofting debris. That is dissimilar, so any debris that is being lofted by a tornado is dissimilar from the surrounding precipitation. So it's a really powerful product, and in the wintertime, we could also see where there's rain versus snow and how that's uh, delineated between the two. So I'm going to send it over to Chauncey Schultz, and he's going to explain how that new technology has really helped us with especially severe weather. So we added that new dual, dual polarization technology in 2012. So it's relatively recent, considering that the radar itself is going on about 30 years old, or just about 30 years now. Um, the dual polarization in the last decade or so has really helped us to better detect different kinds of rain and snow, the precipitation types, and it's really helped us detect hail a lot better than we did historically because we can tell if it's small hail, if it's extra large hail now, that really helps us with our warnings. One other thing that we can detect is actually debris. So thankfully, we haven't observed that from our radar very often, but if a tornado 
does damage, the debris field, so all sort of structures and things like that as it gets lofted by a tornado, actually gives a different type of signal as well. The dual polarization technology lets us parse that out from regular rain and hail and a big damaging supercell thunderstorm, so we can actually detect if a tornado is causing damage from the radar, if it's close enough to the radar, which we never historically could do before we had dual polarization. So it might look like a bucket of spilled paint to some people on radar, but meteorologists behind the scene, we look at those products mm -hmm. to give uh, more insight as to what's happening, especially with these strong thunderstorms using that dual polarization technology. Very interesting. It's so amazing what you can do, though, because yeah. you got to see things on, on the XY scale, right? Not just one, but both to get an idea, as, as Jacob so eloquently uh, laid out there for yeah. us on radar. So Good stuff. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. Welcome. This is part six of our series, yeah. <laughs> only one more part left after this one, and we're getting into a few more topics. This one's going to be about the limitations of radar, because even though they're very advanced machines that have been upgraded over the years, there are still some limitations and some precipitation that we can't see because of certain uh, obstructions or distances from radar. So a reminder that the radar beam increases in elevation as it goes out from the radar. So the farther away you are from the radar site, the higher in the atmosphere the radar is sampling. And the way that we can look at that is, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about the volume coverage patterns. When there's no precipitation in the area, we just use clear air mode. What that means is the radar scans only a few elevation angles up in the atmosphere. And again, the beam goes up in elevation as you go away from the radar site. When there's precipitation in the area, specifically thunderstorms, we go at a, a, a lot more different elevation angles, much higher up in the atmosphere, sampling those tall thunderstorms. But still, the farther away you are from the radar site, site, the less data that we can get because the radar beam increases in elevation. Another uh, kind of downfall of radars is that you can't see precipitation directly above it. What that's called is the cone of silence. So at the Bismarck radar, the Minot radar, precipitation directly above the radar site, we can't see because the radar beams go out at an angle. Now with our coverage of weather service uh, radars across the country, we have a pretty good network to see what precipitation is happening, but there are some notable gaps. In Bismarck and uh, Minot, those radars can really see precipitation well over central and eastern North Dakota, but western North Dakota gets left out a little bit because the radar beam is a lot higher up. So here's some of the notable gaps in radar coverage across the country. Some of them are in more populated areas, such as Charlotte, North Carolina, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and more in Tornado Alley down south, where uh, that's a little bit more problematic. In North Dakota, as I mentioned, mentioned far western North Dakota, the radar beam is more than 10,000 feet above the ground. So that doesn't mean there's no radar coverage in far western North Dakota. It just means it's a little bit harder to see the uh, precipitation and detect low level features such as snowfall or uh, rotation within thunderstorms. But there is something that the Minot radar has done recently in order to try to combat that. So the Minot radar is one of the only radars in the country that actually scans at an elevation below 0.5. So thanks to research that was done within the last couple of years, we lowered the angle of the Minot radar to 0.3 to try and gather more information at a lower altitude over western North Dakota to help with the detection of weather that's important to the western part of the state. It might not seem like that much of a difference, but it is when you start talking about elevation angles further and further from the radar as the Earth curves. So that base reflectivity angle that most radars use, 0.5 degrees above zero, uh, is useful for most locations, but with the much more limited coverage in western North Dakota, having that 0.3 degree elevation angle is really useful. In 2018, there was a tornado that came through Watford City, and unfortunately there was a death attributed with that tornado, but that goes to show that sometimes there could be um, some gaps in the radar coverage in the far western part of the state, and we need further uh, radars, more data, in those areas to get low-level information with either severe thunderstorms or in the winter time with detecting snowfall that might be falling in that area. So what there is, is with the Department of Water Resources, they have a radar in Bowman as well as in Stanley, and those radars can help to detect precipitation in far western North Dakota. They're a little bit of a lower power radar, and actually are radars that the National Weather Service used to use. They're now just repurposed, and again, Bowman and Stanley. So here are some of the useful applications of those radars for western North Dakota residents. Well, the purpose of the radars originally was to, and still is, um, to support the cloud seeding program in Western North Dakota that is conducted every summer during June, July, and August. 
So that was the original intent of getting the radars deployed uh, to help in that effort. As far as uh, the radar gaps in Western North Dakota go, we've been operating the Bowman radar year round since 2011 to, to help fill a gap in coverage in the National Weather Service radar network. Uh, that's been a, a nice bonus um, for the citizens that live in those areas. In the wintertime, especially when precipitation, um, the clouds that produce it are lower. They're not as high as thunderstorms in the summer. We need a radar that can fill in a gap and can do a better job of, uh, of detecting the precipitation that's lower to the ground. I, I think it is unique, and, and um, I've had some conversations with some colleagues of mine in some of the other Western states, and this actually was a discussion. Of this was a genesis of some work that was going on and is going on currently in Colorado to help fill some gaps in radar coverage there, too, in the mountainous western part of the state where, where they had significant gaps in coverage. Uh, so I think things like this can be very helpful uh, to, you know, filling in these coverage gaps in the National Weather Service system. So the Weather Service radars are a great resource. We couldn't do it without them, but there are some limitations, and those radars in Bowman and Stanley are some helpful resources that we can use to see precipitation in that kind of gap in western North Dakota. Excellent and job. Interesting as always. Yeah. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. During our deep dive radar series over the past six weeks, I've taken you inside the Bismarck National Weather Service's radar to explain the basics of how it works, talked about how it tilts to different elevation angles to create a three-dimensional picture of the atmosphere, discussed how maintenance is performed, explained how the Doppler and dual polarization technologies that radars use to see inside of storms, and finally talked about some of the limitations of our current radar network. But how did we get to this point in radar technology and what's in store for the future? Here's a brief history of weather radars. The underlying principle of all radars was first observed in 1886 by Heinrich Hertz when he found that electromagnetic waves could be reflected off of various objects and even focused into beams by appropriate reflectors. Various research projects continued on radar's potential applications, and by 1930, Lawrence Highland with the Naval Research Laboratory discovered that an airplane flying over his radio antenna caused changes in the signals that it received. In 1935, Robert Watson Watt used pulsed radio frequency energy to observe targets at longer ranges up to 90 miles away. By World War II, radar was used by militaries around the world scanning for incoming airplanes. But the use of radar for weather observations occurred by accident as military radar operators noticed that precipitation was showing up on their displays along with their intended aircraft targets. After the war, the National Weather Service received 25 radars that had been used by the Navy, and in 1959, the Weather Service began rolling out its first network of radars called the Weather Surveillance Radar, or WSR-57, as it was designed in 1957 using that World War II technology. It gave only coarse reflectivity data and no velocity data, which made it extremely difficult to detect tornadoes. Precipitation was traced across the radar screen using grease pencils and forecasters had to manually turn a crank to adjust the radar's scan elevation. An updated version, the WSR-74, supplemented and replaced the older radars beginning in 1977 with newer and more reliable components. 128 of the WSR-57 and WSR-74 model radars were spread across the country, including in North Dakota, and operated as the Weather Service's radar network until the 1990s. Meanwhile, in the 1980s, researchers began developing the Next Generation Radar System, or NEXRAD, that would incorporate the use of Doppler technology. This was a big step forward for meteorologists, allowing them to detect the speed and direction of precipitation within storms. These WSR WSR 88D radars, with the D standing for Doppler, were deployed operationally beginning in 1992. The resolution of the data was much higher with these radars, and severe weather was easier to pinpoint. The Bismarck WSR 88D radar was installed in 1994, and radar technology has continued to improve since then, with several upgrades to the nationwide network, especially with the introduction of dual polarization technology that has happened over the past 10 years. 155 NEXRAD radars are now positioned across the country, with most of them either co-located with National Weather Service offices or near Air Force bases, as is the case with the radar northeast of Minot. Even though the NEXRAD radars have now exceeded their original lifespan estimate of 20 years, the radars are currently undergoing a service life extension program to keep them operating into the 2030s. 
But in the meantime, private companies such as Climavision have stepped in to try to help fill in some of the gaps in the existing National Weather Service radar network with their own proprietary radars. And future radar technology, such as faster scanning phased array radars that can be steered electronically, giving users the ability to control how, when, and where the radar scans, is being researched and developed. Wrapping up this series, I hope you now have a deeper appreciation of weather radar technology that many of us take for granted. And think about how radars work the next time you load up the radar on our app or see us use radar on air. For your news leader, I'm Jacob Morse.